case um, you all missed out on the previous ones and would like to revisit the discussions, the recordings are available on the Nautical Institute Singapore's LinkedIn page. Um, so please, of course, uh, sign up and like our LinkedIn pages and uh, uh, Insta pages as well. And you would stay abreast with uh, all our latest uh, webinars and other material. Our next webinar is on cybersecurity and that is scheduled for the 28th of October, same time, 1600 hours Singapore time. So please block out your diaries and order the popcorn. Uh, in the meantime, we shall get the uh, advert together and shall circulate it. Um, although this is like a broken record for our regular webinar participants, I would once again like to remind all our viewers that unfortunately due to the extraordinary COVID-19 situation, our Singapore branch annual seminar for 2020 has been postponed and is now scheduled to take place sometime around the third quarter of 2021. We trust we have your understanding on this and look forward to your participation as usual to make it a success. I would now like to pass the microphone to our branch president, Captain Eves Vanderborn, to share with us briefly on the branch activities and introduce our external panel for today. Over to you, Eves. Thanks, Harry. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining um, this webinar, which is promising to be really interesting on this uh, topic, but I will let Harry explain the topic later. A little bit more on the Nautical Institute for those of you who are maybe not yet aware or who are not a member of the Nautical Institute. Um, and I is a global independent body for maritime professionals. Um, it's run by seafarers and it promotes the standing of the maritime profession afloat and ashore. The NI also has NGO status at the IMO, so it really um, is able to help the seafarers with their qualifications and the quality directly at the highest level at the UN IMO. Um, some of the big examples for, for that uh, the NI was able to accomplish would be the offshore DP certification, which they set up, which they administer, and which has now been accepted for some long time already worldwide as an industry standard. The Singapore branch of the Nautical Institute was founded in 2015, quite late actually, because the NI originally started out in 1990. Um, we had our first meeting here in Singapore in 2016 and have been able to organize quite a number of successful smaller webinars and, as Harry mentioned, our annual bigger uh, seminar. At the moment, we have about 200 members here, but I am sure that there should be quite a lot more people who are working in the maritime and who should be joining the NI and have the benefits. It is not expensive. It, you pay around 140 pounds a year. Um, you get a free Seaways magazine um, delivered to you on a monthly basis. You get free one video tell training annually that you can use. There is professional recognition that you can mention on your LinkedIn pages or in your signatures. And um, there is legal insurance cover actually as well for any professional uh, criminalization that you may encounter um, as a seafarer. Now enough about the NI. I would like to introduce our panels for today. First up is uh, Daniel Apt. Daniel. Um, Daniel is um, hi Daniel. Daniel is a naval architect with about 20 years of experience in shipbuilding industry. He is currently working in the Container Ship Excellence Center of uh, the MVGL, though he previously was working with GL as well, uh, where he started his classification career. He is specialized in structural calculation of cargo securing equipment and calculation and testing of container lashing arrangements. So the perfect guy to talk about um, lashings for today. Then we have um, Stuart McAllister. Hi, Stuart. Uh, Stuart has a 52 year career behind him, which you wouldn't say when you look at him. Um, he sailed as master on um, Megabox ships. The last five years of his career, he was on 20,000 TEU container ships. Um, he is now retired and 
has uh, settled down in Cape Town, South Africa, where he is doing several consultancy appointments, uh, both in legal matters, but he also has extensive experience in setting up, uh, developing and implementing ISM manuals for companies, where he does a lot of seminars about as well. And last on our panel, but not least, we have Graham Hill. Graham spent uh, 23 years at sea, also eight years as a master on a variety of vessel types. Um, interestingly, on bulk carriers operating in Canadian ice conditions is not immediately where I choose to go and sail. Um, he joined Brooks Bell in 2012 and has spent several years monitoring loading and securing of break bulk and project cargoes in various Chinese ports. He has carried out a, multiple, uh, a multitude of casualty and incident investigations, including container stack collapses. So I'm sure we will be hearing more about that uh, later when he is speaking. He is also involved in frac removal operations and provides expert advice on uh, arbitration and disputes. A very good panel indeed. And as always, it will be expertly moderated by our very own Vice President, um, Harry. I don't really need to introduce Harry to people these days. Um, Harry has a long sailing career on uh, a wide variety of vessels. He joined uh, Ship Owners Club in 2009 and reason re recently was promoted to the Regional Head of Business Relations um, based here in Singapore. We also have uh, Ken Allen online and Ken will be assisting with the Q&A session later on. Ken is um, has a long career on the offshore market as master and has worked in uh, Singapore on consultancy basis for the last, forget about five years now, I think, Ken? Yep. Um, good. Everybody enjoy. Harry, over to you. Oh, hello, everyone, again. Um, thank you, Yves. And as usual, um, very excited for such a knowledgeable uh, group of panelists joining us today. Uh, before we proceed any further, a few house rules of today's session. Of course, we have to have our rules and regulations, and we request your kind understanding and cooperation of the same. If you have a question, we request you to use the Q&A chat function and type out your question. You all can vote on the questions already raised in case it is similar to the ones you already have in mind. We shall raise this to our panel as appropriate. Please don't take it personally and uh, hate mail me in case your question is not discussed as we are faced with a time constraint as always. It is the fag end and end of the day for many of us and people would like to uh, go away quickly. The questions will be taken up by us at a Q&A session after all the panelists have presented their views. So uh, that will be the exciting part of the end. I would like to reiterate my sincere request to the audience. Use your discretion when posing uh, questions to our panelists and they should be in line with the topic of discussion. Um, if the questions are not relevant or considered inappropriate, they will not be presented to our panelists. So please bear with us. Should there be any unaddressed issues during this webinar, please feel free to write to us at singapore.branch at notinch.org. If your eyesight is very good, uh, it is there in my backdrop, but you will have to strain. But in any way, you can get in touch with us. Right. So ladies and gentlemen, moving to our topic of discussion today. With the huge strides made with the advent of technology, including computerized systems to compute the stability of the vessel with just a few clicks of your keyboard or your mouse, uh, whichever, and as well as the ability of precise shearing, shearing force and bending moment calculations exerted on the lashing components. I mean, nowadays everything is on software. One would assume that the shipboard staff would actually have it on a platter and should be actually sitting um, on a hammock or an armchair smoking a pipe with a comfort factor of these machines. However, in reality, this is not the case. And to throw more light on this theme, I would like to call upon Daniel Apt as our first speaker. Daniel has already been introduced and um, I think he's in a very good position to actually uh, discuss what we have for him. Dan, uh, welcome and many thanks for being our panelist uh, for this webinar. I have a few questions as usual before to set the scene and to start the ball rolling. 
So based on your experience and expertise on design and approval of cargo securing manuals and cargo securing systems, perhaps you could enlighten us on what assumptions are made and what are the watch out points and other points that need to be taken into consideration when one uses the cargo securing manual for lashing containers on board. Also to specifically discuss the weather considerations taken into account at design and approval stage, because when we think that our state of art weather monitoring and tracking systems have have our backs. Hell hath no fury like mother nature. So um, if you could please tell us about um, the assumptions, shortcomings, etc., then uh, it would be very useful for our panel. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Harry. Uh, I'm very glad to be invited today and uh, yeah, I'll try to answer some of the questions you raised. And uh, maybe it's not fully possible, but uh, I will do my very best here. Yeah. Uh, so I will just uh, try to share the slides I have prepared and uh, hope that you can see them all very well and that you can hear me. Yes, Dan. Yeah, loud and clear and visible as well. That is good. Uh, so I would like to give a sh short, very uh, compressed uh, technical background of the uh, uh, container lashing yeah, assumptions, uh, lashing system assumptions for calculation and what's the regulatory background. But uh, yeah, as I said, just a rough and compressed background, just not to bore you too much. Um, first of all, uh, it needs to be kept in mind that the container itself is part of its lashing system. And uh, so the strength of the container uh, limits also the lashing system because it's the weakest part of the lashing system. Uh, the container securing equipment such as twist locks, lashing bars and so on usually have a safety factor or are designed for a safety factor of two, which means they have a brake load and uh, the safe working load is half of the braking load at least. While the container itself is uh, certified according to ISO 496 and ISO 496 gives, uh, describes different test criteria for certification such also as the stacking where the uh, corner posts are compressed or the transverse racking. And uh, unfortunately, these containers don't have a yeah, reasonable margin above these certified values. So the safety factor for these uh, overstacking or uh, transverse racking is cl very close to one. Um, when Considering uh, container lashings on board or container lashing calculations, normally the container stacks are stowed in longitudinal direction on, on deck. Um, and uh, so there are the ship motions uh, inducing accelerations to the container stack as well as uh, external forces such as wind or green sea. And uh, the container weights, of course, uh, also have a large large uh, impact on the forces on the lashing system. Um, these external loads then uh, induce the forces in the lashing system and these are for the stacks on deck usually tilting forces. So the stack is tilting and uh, this needs to be uh, transferred into the hedge cover structure or deck structure by some foundations and uh, if the wrecking load, for example, which sums up from the uppermost container to the lowest, uh, is exceeding the certified value for the containers, uh, then lashings may have to be fitted uh, to reduce the wrecking load and also the lifting load. Uh, on the right side of the slide, you can see uh, such a container test, which has been carried out uh, for certification of a container, and this container has failed the stacking test. Um, the seaway which is being taken into account uh, is uh, for usual ship design questions, but also for this uh, task of uh, container lashing calculations uh, are northern Atlantic sea conditions. And um, so in DNVGL, we consider uh, for on-deck stacks, usually the healing case, the rolling case, because this is most critical for the longitudinally stowed stacks. And this, uh, we apply a 
uh, transverse acceleration factor. And this transverse acceleration factor, which you can see uh, uh, BQ, which is shown in this sketch, is a combined combination of different shares of accelerations of the caused by the roll motion. And the wave data uh, on which this is calculated, uh, you can see on the left side a plot which shows uh, yeah, the average wave, significant wave height of the sea areas which are plotted in this, in this uh, world plot. For these areas, there are wave scatter data measurements for very long uh, um, um, terms uh, available. And uh, you can see this plot of the wave, uh, significant wave height averages uh, um, can be treated something like a, a plot of the severity of these, uh, or statistical severity of these, uh, all these sea areas. And these North Atlantic sea areas, eight, number eight, nine, 15, and 16, uh, which are used for ship design and also for lashing calculation design, are uh, within this uh, yeah, hardly to to to, to see uh, oval green area. So they are on the upper edge of the all the and um, the upper range of all the uh, sea areas from point of severity. Uh, and on top of that oval of the North Atlantic. Uh, um, sea areas, there's this uh, so-called IX recommendation 34, so for the, uh, of the Association of Classification Societies, they have issued a uh, recommendation to set up a, a design wave criteria, and that is used in such calculations as a basis to do ship motion analysis uh, to determine accelerations on vessels. Um, apart from this unrestricted service accelerations based on North Atlantic, uh, DNVGL offers uh, so-called route-specific sto container storage notations for uh, long-haul routes and limited short voyages. The long-haul part uh, refers to um, yeah, long-term uh, trade patterns of vessels. So this gives uh, some slight reduction of accelerations depending on where the vessel uh, might say might be employed on, um, and for the other option, the limited short. I uh, know for this uh, long haul, sorry, for this long haul route approach, uh, we offer a um, web interface to calculate the reduction for each uh, actual route uh, that can be very easily um, calculated by a web application that is freely available or accessible. On request. The part of limited short voyages is um, just an option which is intended to allow for a reduction of necessary restores when, for example, vessels are uh, entering the collecting trips along the coastline where they have different, uh, different ports in a very short time uh, and where the uh, expected weather conditions can be uh, yeah, well uh, uh, determined before leaving the, the harbor. So this limited short voyages is a weather dependent lashing approach uh, to re allow for uh, higher reductions, but just for trips which uh, do not last longer than three days. So that the weather conditions uh, uh, should be relatively uh, um, yeah, secure, le determined. When calculating the lashing forces after having determined the acceleration on the uh, on the stacks due to motions of the vessels, uh, the lashing forces have to be calculated in the stack. And this lashing force calculations, uh, the NVGL uh, has uh, developed uh, a calculation approach, an analytic calculation approach about 40 years ago. Um, that worked quite well for some decades, but uh, in recent years uh, we determined that this old analytic approach of a spring system for each end of container stacks was not too um, flexible anymore to uh, calculate 
especially container lashing systems on larger actual vessels because these lashing systems on these ever larger vessels get more complicated and uh, yeah, sometimes difficult to calculate exactly. So we needed to introduce a new calculation um, method that also considers uh, the clearance of the twist locks in between the containers efficiently um, as also other uh, items. So we did uh, recently a full scale con stack of uh, stack test of containers and different container configurations and measured all these uh, all the movements and forces in the stack as a reference data. So that was the first time that some classification society or an organization did such tests. And uh, based on these full scale tests, which were quite comprehensive, uh, we set up a dynamic uh, calculation model of such stacks to reproduce the test results, to have a validated container uh, strength model. As you can see on the left side, lower side, these are the deflection results of such container stacks. Um, the uh, downside of such dynamic calculations is that they are very, very time consuming. So such calculation of one stack um, which is very precise, but takes around six hours, uh, which is of course not usable in an onboard environment. So we needed to transfer this calculation um, background into another solver, which is quasi-static, uh, but still nonlinear and reproducing same results as a dynamic calculation. So we introduced this 3D uh, solver with a strengths characteristics of the dynamic model based on the test. And this uh, new 3D method uh, gives physically the most accurate results uh, for container stacks on the market at the moment. Um, it considers lashings and twist locks and the containers non-linearly. It considers uh, shocks of the twist locks when being engaged in the during healing motion and yeah, we are very happy with the results because this calculation is now taking uh, around half a second for a full bay of a big container vessel compared to six hours for one stack uh, in the dynamic calculation and gives uh, almost exactly the same results. Just comparing the old, where well, there's a new calculation approach. So this old calculation approach uh, is a spring system which is uh, fast but uh, rather yeah, at, the, at the end of its uh, development uh, possibilities. Uh, this new 3D calculation uh, fully uh, considers the 3D pro properties of the container. Um, and most important for us is also that we can extend this method for the future. So it's a uh, yeah, future development. We can uh, measure other container types. As of now, container lashing calculations just consider uh, closed boxes, let's say, these closed general freight containers. In the future, we can uh, consider open top containers, reef, uh, tank containers, um, yeah, everything that is uh, can be measured so far. Uh, we can also uh, implement or we are implementing now an eigenfrequency check so to review whether there are uh, ship motions can um, induce vibrations of the stacks that can lead to violent uh, lashing forces or even contact between stacks would be possible in a later stage of development. Um, with these container lashing calculations, they are all implemented in the container securing arrangement or container securing manual in the cargo securing manual. So the container securing arrangement plan is a part of the cargo securing manual. The cargo securing manual is uh, approved uh, by the flag or on behalf of the flag, while the container securing arrangement is usually uh, a class scope because the container lashing calculations are mainly uh, class related because they have been developed before uh, implementation of cargo securing manuals historically. 
The whole cargo securing manual and especially the container securing arrangement is then uh, the basis to set up the lashing computer nowadays. Uh, so lashing computers are of course well known since some time, but uh, in 2013, uh, DNVGL uh, introduced the requirement for an approval of these lashing computers because uh, yeah, an evaluation of actual lashing conditions on board uh, it is not feasible or practically feasible anymore by such a paper booklet. So just summarizing the background of the cargo securing manual, that's a document required by SOLAS for dry cargo ships greater than 500 GT uh, and gives more generic information for masters or advice uh, and con um, contains for container vessels uh, the container securing arrangement plan and for new vessels also a cargo safe access plan. Um, the container securing arrangement plan itself is normally uh, showing the vessel main data, the maximum capacity for the vessel uh, uh, from slot capacity. Uh, it shows the limitations of the ship structure for the cargo stowage. That means the maximum stack rates on deck, the uh, lashing patterns. Um, and it shows a sample condition for uh, yeah, maximum weight distribution for maximum capacity. However, this sample uh, condition for actual vessels or for vessels already since uh, maybe 2004, it can hardly be used to really review actual loading conditions because they are so much different from uh, the condition described in here. The lashing computer itself, that's the only tool that is uh, practically uh, enabling yeah, operators to evaluate the lashing condition on board. Um, so in most cases, the lashing computer is a module of the loading computer. There are a few uh, separate alternatives, but uh, in most cases, it's a module of the loading computer, which of course makes sense to integrate that. Um, so the lashing computer should clearly show where there are excesses even in, in, on the screen as well as in any printout that should be somehow filed. Um, yeah, and as I said, uh, since 2013, these uh, lashing computers are also scope of approval in order to uh, ensure a consistent uh, quality. Of course, uh, the lashing application of lashing patterns uh, need to be ensured as uh, planned in this container securing arrangement plan. These lashing patterns also get become more and more complicated and with lashing bridges very high, uh, that's a lot of uh, climbing uh, effort for crews uh, to, let's say, um, yeah, uh, to supervise uh, lashing operations. And this is uh, another headache, of course, for crews to make sure that all the lashing patterns and all the equipment is uh, used as intended by the, all the plans. So these large vessels still have some uh, yeah, extra effort be, uh, yeah, being put on the crews. And last but not least, for a uh, reliable working of the container lashing system. It's uh, of course necessary that all the equipment is maintained uh, in a usable way. So foundations or sockets on deck like this, uh, everyone can of course, uh, I suppose, agree that this will not uh, be able to bear the loads which can occur in a fully full container stack when put on that uh, on such a socket. Uh, so currently we develop a um, a wear and tear guideline for replacement of such equipment, which we haven't had yet explicitly formulated in our rules. Um, yeah. I am uh, currently at the end of my presentation and I hope I didn't, it wasn't too boring for you or too, too fast. Uh, I thought it was very compressed and uh, if you have any further questions, then yeah, I'll be happy to reply in any Q 
Q&A or during the next sessions in the chat. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Dan. Uh, excellent presentation. Actually, uh, there is a lot for everyone to take in. And um, putting yourself in the shoes of a mariner who's going to be calculating stability and doing all this, I would be like, uh, oops, well, it's it's not exactly our forte. So uh, you've given us a lot on the behind the scenes, but when the person is actually using such um, such um, programs and all that, we know what's in the front, but what's at the back really is something which you have actually enlightened us, but I don't think the mariner would um, uh, would want to get into the details. So I'm, I'm going to have a seafarer's perspective now. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Daniel. And I invite on screen now, uh, Captain Stuart McAllister. Hey, Stuart. Hi. Um, you've had many, many years at sea. And you've seen the transition from stone ages of shipping, the medieval or transitional ages, and now the so-called modern digital era. And you've seen Daniel's presentation. Yeah, there it was mind boggling for us, uh, for us sea dogs. Um, can you share with us based on this also, your thoughts on this evolution and how things have stacked up from what they were earlier? How easy or difficult are these now? Um, it's the perception that it's very easy because you've got everything with a few clicks, but apparently there's that false sense of security from the mariner because some of us like to have complete control of what we're doing. How comprehensive has and has the completeness and reliability of these systems been? And if there's anything more that can be done to simplify it from a user interface, um, there's also that angle that while we may want to have a nice rosy garden of Eden, stevedores and port facilities, are they able to support these requirements or are there any compromises that need to be made, maybe commercial pressure uh, while sailing out? And I must say the fast turnaround of this nature of trade doesn't help at all. Um, over to you, Stuart. Thank you. That was a lot of questions, and I'm certainly going to try and uh, answer a few of them and uh, come back if I fail to do so, Harry. And I'm sure that uh, our participants will be um, messaging in as well. Um, still morning here in South Africa, but I'm, I'm reasonably wide awake. And uh, I, I'm just reflecting, first of all, on, on Daniel's presentation. And I believe that in a, in a long career, it's the first time I've heard such a comprehensive description of <clears throat> how lashing systems are arrived at and uh, the amount of calculation that goes into it. And uh, it seems to me as, a, as almost a gut reaction that there's room for much better education within our own profession on what we're dealing with in terms of the forces and uh, and equipment that's uh, at our disposal to, to ensure that we complete a safe voyage. I'm delighted to be able to share some, some thoughts on, on the whole discussion and how it affects daily life on board. I'm really proud to announce to everyone who's in our webinar that uh, in all my time, not once did I actually suffer a, a cargo loss over the side or, or indeed a collapse on deck. It's not to say I didn't have in the early days damage to cargo in cargo holds. Lashings were as, as lashings are. Uh, we subject them to extraordinary forces and suddenly they just they don't cope in spite of our best efforts. Um, but I've been involved in the maritime industry, as Eve said in the earlier introduction, um, over a period of spanning six decades. And I've mentioned to the team last week when we got to know one another that I'd like to try and draw some differences between then and now. Sorry, that's my telephone going off in my house here. Um, working out stability was always a pretty manual process throughout the vast majority of the, the first sort of almost 30 years of my career, 25 years anyway. Um, we, we, we had a look at, at machines to give us a, a view of how the stability would look from the point of view of pre-planning our cargos. I wonder if anybody is listening in who remembers the wondrous machine called the Ralston Indicator. And it was quite literally a balancing table on which you applied small little defined weights 
and you pulled a lever and the thing would balance out and show you things like trim and uh, GM and one or two other things. I, I wish I had them as a collection of my nautical memorabilia. Um, and then, of course, there was always the manual calculation and good old paper and so on that we had we used to confirm. Um, lashing of cargoes on the hold on deck was really a bit of gut feel and ingenuity. Heavy lifts were given enough lashings in my view that when you took the combined strength of those lashings, um, you could have pretty much turned the ship upside down and the heavy lift on deck would have hung there in its lashings. We had sufficient strength to be able to do that. That was a, almost a rule of thumb that was applied that you could lift the thing that you were lashing with, its, with the lashing forces. Um, <clears throat> a lot of it, however, was down to uh, gut feel and what used to be described as the ordinary practice of, of semen. And we got a lashing layout and an application by and large that worked reasonably well most of the time. I remember some of my earlier ships um, which had, I remember one specifically that had a, a GM on sailing from good old Blighty out to uh, India that uh, we had one foot and nine inches and the, the captain declared himself quite satisfied with that and it was comprehensible, it kind of made sense and uh, we we kind of had a mind picture that this one foot nine inches gave us a sort of mindset of she'll come back up again if she's knocked over to one side. Um, given the way that we planned voyages, uh, we didn't have up to date up to date forecasting for large areas. Of course, we we spent time with things like uh, our good old weather maps, the seasonal weather maps uh, produced by the. Um, NOAA in the States, we had our trusty old pilot books of course, and then Ocean Passages for the World and using that background material you drew up your accumulated knowledge of seasonal meteorology and, and sea conditions and, and kind of lashed accordingly for the voyage you were undertaking. Then old Sparky got on his headphones and listened to weather forecasts with all the codes and we made out our own isobar charts and looked at it and said, yep, yeah, we've got it all. You know, it's all in front of us now. If I go forward quite a, quite a big step through all those days of early general cargo into container ships, um, for the, as far as the stability was concerned, uh, we had a good old, who remembers the Cockham's Loadmaster, this wondrous, ingenious machine that you fed in all your tanks, you put in a, a tier weight of every bay of, of cargo, and voila, there it was, a little red LED lights on a, on a screen on the, on the profile of the ship, gave us the draft fore and aft, the, the GM, the uh, uh, bending moments, the shear forces, it was a wondrous, wondrous machine. And you used it for the planned condition and then the final condition, and then made manual calculations with uh, you know, one, of, one of those things, remember those? And, uh, we were able to have a recorded record of the state of stability, but that wasn't really looking at, at lashing. Um, I remember uh, that the lashing on those early container ships where we started out with only two high and then kind of crept on to three high on deck on, on ships of two and a half thousand TEU and a length overall of about 260 meters, that uh, there didn't seem to be a, a very big rule book on where one applied um, uh, lashings. If you had enough kind of left over after heavy over light or something like that, you kind of plunked them on the outside just as a belt and braces that you would kind of lash the outside of the stack and everything would stay in board. And again, that, that worked. And I, I do sort of fondly recall uh, the company at the time laying down with very little reference to science, as, as I recall, that the minimum GM for the ocean voyage would be, and it was graven in marble, 60 centimeters. In your head, two feet, ship, you know, a few hundred feet long. Yeah, yeah, it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, it wasn't very scientific. Um, 
and, and I certainly remember that sailing with that 60 centimeter of GM made the ship very, very comfortable indeed. We were uh, a nice, long, easy rolling period, maybe reduced a little bit because we had nice uh, Rolls Royce stabilizers and uh, lashing patterns, as I said, were, were haphazard and done pretty much on a common sense of the sort of approach. Sorry, I've made a few notes here. Uh, m moving forward in that lengthy career by, by quite, a, quite a step, um, I was appointed in 2007 to stand by the building in Germany of some uh, quite specialized Panamax uh, container vessels, uh, 4,200 TEU, built very specifically to give a very fast service between the Far East, China specifically, and the East Coast of the United States, across the Pacific and through Panama. That needed a service speed of 29.2 knots, if I recollect. And uh, in fact, we could do over, over 32 knots on occasion. Uh, there were pretty fast ships. Suddenly, suddenly the future was with us and a lot more attention paid to what we had, not, not only on the, on the loading computer, but starting to build in some of the, uh, the lashing modules so that we could understand what was happening on the ship. Because suddenly the forces were, were extremely high and started to go a little bit beyond um, human comprehension. And we needed now a pictorial representation of, of what was safe and specifically what was not safe. And uh, the, the big word that suddenly arrived in our lexicon was parametric rolling, two words. And um, in order to try and be guarded against the effects of either synchronous or parametric rolling, we did get fitted with some uh, additional display on the bridge where there was a lot of sensing of the actual movement of the hull itself. It's, it's flexing and twisting and nearness to the water in terms of pitching and so on. All of these things, we had sensors in the hull and we could actually put in the weather forecasts into this wondrous system and it would forward predict the areas, the courses and speeds at which we had a risk of either synchronous or, or parametric rolling and thus we could adopt a change of speed of course and uh, to, to avoid these systems and not place total reliance on just the lashing systems on the deck to hold the load on. So that was a, a kind of a different step. I then graduated via 9,000 TEU vessels. So there were literally, you know, more than twice the capacity that I've been sailing on. And suddenly for the first time I was seeing these pretty high loads on deck, eight, nine high, um, lashing bridges up to about the third height, and these big, almost unsupported stacking systems above that, and certainly nothing that rods could lash to. Suddenly, uh, we were paying a lot more attention, spending a lot more focused effort on checking absolutely every twist lock. In fact, we went to automatic twist locks, eventually, which ended up having a bit of a short lifespan. But it, it suddenly, the, the big physical difficulty for us then was um, actually being able to see what was going on. There was, there was nowhere high enough where you could look down and see well enough. And standing on deck, literally physically gazing up, perhaps eight high on deck, it was difficult to see that things were properly placed in terms of the corner twist locks. The lashings we could check easily, and, uh, but then when the ship was working on a seaway, there was quite a lot of movement on deck. I, I'd like then to fast forward a, a little step again, about another um, seven years, and I found myself um, on the mega container ships, approximately 20,000 uh, TEU, 11 high on deck, 400 meter long ship, um, 23 knot speed and trans-ocean, we, we were in the Pacific Rim 
uh, which meant uh, typhoon conditions and so on, the Indian Ocean and then the North Atlantic, including winter time. And, and suddenly, again, physically on deck, much more difficult to see after what was happening. Um, the lashing pattern had 36 or more different kinds of equipment in terms of the types of stackers, twist locks, lengths of bars, types of turnbuckles, inside, outside, cross, double, triple lashings, depending on the loads. And you had to try and follow all of that through on the lashing, sorry, the stability computer with its lashing module. Um, un unfortunately, those systems at the time were not linked in any way to weather forecasting systems, but the planning of the containers was done in a dynamic way so that they were, they were taken consideration of changing weather patterns and sea conditions, but we couldn't actually see it on board. And again, um, with, you know, perhaps uh, 11,000 TEU on deck, and uh, one officer and perhaps one rating or one cadet uh, 24 hours around trying to check the positioning of every uh, piece of lashing equipment and the condition of every container started to become further and further away as a possibility. So one had to just put faith that um, the, the very long chain that represents container logistics held up under your decreasing ability to actually check everything and then double check it again. Suddenly we were depending on the lashing guys or the planner or the central coordinator or whoever that you couldn't do the whole thing on your own and, and your ability to be the strongest link in the chain started to be reduced. Throw in things like the hours of rest regulations uh, which limits uh, the time that you've got people available to do the checking, uh, pre-departure checks, uh, security, import security checks, and all the other myriad things of bunkering and stores and crew changes and handovers and all that good stuff. Suddenly the ability uh, to spend quality time on a quality job gets pushed and pushed and pushed. So you have to start placing quite a lot of faith. Um, the, I, I reached out to a few of my colleagues just to get a couple of comments from them. And uh, here's one of my mates. He said, uh, thanks for your mail. And after 45 years at sea, I still have a zero record for loss of containers at sea. But in my opinion, it is a combination of avoiding the rough weather and remember to reduce speed in due time. Today, there is a pressure on the schedules to reach for this for ETA. I have a feeling that many younger masters have a higher focus on ETA than to reduce damage to vessel on cargo. I also do feel that over and over we experience that the wind and sea is higher than the weather prediction indicates. It might be that the weather is getting more rough and less predictable by the forecasting that we get from different weather forecasting providers. Uh, the cargo securing systems are very different from vessel type and you know, between vessel types and some are more complicated with a lot of combinations of short, medium and long rods and correct turnbuckles. And the stevedores and the crew can have challenges to understand and comply. My own comment is that the tasks faced by deck officers and crew members are hugely challenging in the coal face of a port call and I've already gone through some of those. Weather forecasting is part science part mathematical model and part alchemy, it seems to me. Uh, we have an ability, of course, to superimpose planned voyages on mapped representations. And uh, I was sailing with optimization software to try to optimize the voyage contemplated. And you've got to balance that against this need to keep the fuel down to kilograms per mile um, and, and be responsible for that. So. It's not good enough to say, well, it's going to be bad next week, so I'm going to go like hell now and slow down and give myself plenty of time before. The, the limits that we operate in 
are tending to become narrower and narrower. That uh, the the need to save fuel and uh, save the environment and so on is starting to be a little bit overtaking um, the the need to keep the cargo on the deck. We we want to have it, of course, and you know, referring to the stability computers, which have got the lashing modules, we do seem to be moving more and more towards a, a, a red light, green light scenario where on a stack or a bay and so on, if, if we see it green on the screen, then it's okay. But there's no analysis, no, no gut feel, no instinct, no nothing. It's either a red light or a green light. If it's a red light, do something about it. If it's a green light, it must be okay. And that's placing a lot of reliance on the work of uh, Daniel and others in that side of our industry. Um, from my own experience, watching, watching a large container ship, a mega container ship, bend and flex and shudder and move in a seaway is a sobering and indeed frightening experience. Uh, I think when, when the ship is doing this kind of motion, uh, that flexing at the ends, I suspect through my own observation, is meters rather than decimeters. And the accelerations in the cargo stacks and so on is something beyond our human comprehension. That you, you can't say, well, if it's moving two meters, the load is increasing by 25%. We do not have that kind of, of education or measurement or experience or anything else that tells us at what point we're fast approaching the safety factors of, of two that, uh, that Daniel referred to. Um, it's just looking at it and saying, well, I am now, I've gone from happy or, or okay to actually unhappy and I need to do something here. Um, the, and, and I think the other thing from a practical onboard point of view is when you start to walk around a ship that's working in a seaway with 11 high containers on deck, everything is moving. Everything is moving. You can see the, 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 the flexing of the deck load. The bars are bar tight and then they're slack and bar tight and slack. And uh, the crew spend half of their lives going around every second day, tightening, 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 tightening. It's a, it's a huge load just to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And, and the human comprehension of all of that, I, I think is lost. Um, I, I have a feeling that our profession needs to have some sort of increased focus on a more basic education on the forces and stresses that are being experienced in these large deck loads. Um, I think there needs to be, a bit, and Daniel's talk brought it home to me, there needs to be a much better understanding of the lashing systems. I think all of us forget, because it's the cargo, that the container itself is part of the lashing systems. I think that seamen need to be more prepared to reject cargo on the, on the basis of the insufficiency of the structure of a container itself. Some of them are very, very tatty, and I would pretty much put money on some of those old ones being at the root cause of a collapse. Graham will tell us more about that. Um, I, I'd like to see more ability to look at the flexing and uh, stresses that are actually on the hull in the seaway in terms of sensor monitoring, as I experienced before. The problem with these systems is that they are extremely expensive and they're very expensive to look after as we discover. Um, I think a better understanding of the limits that apply, including assessment of loads contemplated in seasonal periods of bad weather systems. Um, I was fortunate enough to sail with an owner who actually did themselves of their own volition set seasonal loads in oceanic regions in terms of uh, the, the, the maximum height load of, of containers on deck. Um, I, would, I would like to see a world too where there's a closer cooperation between those who are planning the cargo and the ship staff who are trying their best to do it. It, it tends to be a bit of a standoff system and discusses the red lights for sure, 
but it doesn't include the entire pattern that's anticipated. It tends to roll out very quickly, difficult for the ship staff to keep up and pick up with what the thinking is in the actual full plan. Um, and but I'll come back to what my colleague said, please uh, take it easy, slow down. An old pilot said to me once in the States, when you're in a hurry, slow down. When you're in a tearing hurry, slow down some more. Good advice, <laughs> I'd say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Stuart. That was amazing, actually. I mean, uh, I must say, uh, it is great that what you've observed over the years and truly heartwarming in line with the values of the Nautical Institute and you very passionate, passionately expressed that seafarers shouldn't be blamed unnecessarily for everything under the sun. And in fact, they are more diligent and committed than ever. Unfortunately, yeah. there are a lot of things um, uh, what, uh, what you cannot see, you cannot do. Um, yes, this is an excellent rhetoric, especially there are many people on this forum in various show-based capacities dealing with incidents on board. The hardships that the seafarers face with is very diluted in comparison to what is an actual fat on board. And thank you for very passionately sharing that with us. Um, it was really great to find out the journey so far. And it's kind of put everything in a nutshell. Um, thank you, Stuart. Moving thank on you, to our third and... Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks Stuart. Yeah. Uh, moving on to our third and final panelist, Captain Graham Hill. Graham, we have saved your round for the last indeed because of your expertise in dealing with container claims. And usually this triggers a lot of discussion. Again, a few questions to get you uh, warmed up. Uh, based on your expertise, what do you feel are the causative factors arising out of investigating such claims? While our systems are getting uh, better, tighter, clearly something is lacking because we are still seeing huge quantum of accidents. Can you put your finger on this? Um, is knowledge and training of the proper use of CSCs and CSMs an issue? Like what Stuart just, uh, do you agree with Stuart? It's a bit too complicated as opposed to traditional calculation of stability, lashings, the containers. Again, the quick turnaround. Time factor, your thoughts, and over to you. Uh, you're on mute before you start. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, thank you, yes. I'll try and answer some of those questions. I, I have, I believe, answered some of those questions. Uh, first of all, I shall try and start up my... Uh, presentation, if I can find it. Okay. Okay. Sorry, let's maybe go a bit slow. Uh, this is my first Zoom web conference, and I'm still learning. So, Graham, would you like to start the slideshow? Yeah, there you are. And then, yeah, loud and clear. So far, yeah, it's okay. good. Yeah. Okay. There we so, are. Okay, all yours. Thank you. Why do containers still fall over? Well, let's try and talk about that, shall we? Yes. I'm going to talk to two issues, first of all, very, very quickly. What, how big is the problem? Is it something that we should be very, very concerned about? And also I'm going to discuss the main elements in our opinion and in our investigations that can lead to these uh, container store collapses. So how big is the problem? The World Shipping Council uh, just this year have uh, issued a new uh, study on the containers which have been lost overboard uh, in the past, 11 years. Now, there's approximately 226 million containers per year. So, you know, it's quite a lot. Cargo value of the $4 trillion, more than 6,000 ships carrying containers. On an average, over the 12 year period, there's been 1,382 containers lost. The last three years, the uh, average has come down to approximately 770. Now you'll see the peaks there. There have obviously been some very particular cases, such as the Rena in 2011, where uh, 900 containers 
2013, the classic mall comfort, over 4,000 containers. And in 2015, the very unfortunate El Faro with over 500 containers. The World Shipping Council does not indicate the number of incidents, only the total number of containers lost. Bear in mind, if there's 226 million containers, that is less than 1,000th of 1% of the containers carried. So, we are doing a good job, but there are things still going wrong. So, what are the main elements that lead to container store collapses? The main elements, this will be a short period, so I'm only going to introduce each one uh, I'll talk about each one. Each one by itself can probably take a full seminar, a full presentation. But what I want to look at is the issues we've found where the master and the crew have some level of control of the situation, where they can affect the outcome, and the issues where they have no control. They're totally reliant upon other people and the equipment in use. So the elements that can be controlled on board, right, the weather. Okay, don't panic. I'm not saying you can control the weather. What we can do is control how we approach weather. Now, the Swedish P&I Club, again this year, very recently, issued the study based on 230 claims over a four-year period. And unfortunately, the main reason is related to container vessels navigating in heavy weather combined with a failure of the crew to reduce speed and or alter course. 50% of the damages are due to a combination of heavy weather and the crew not taking the correct action. So, First of all, we have something that we can think about. Stuart made a very good point earlier where the, the particularly the, nowadays, uh, he says the younger masters, I would debate some of the older masters as well, where ETAs become more important, where these ships that have a schedule, they're well advertised schedules, where they must be in port at a certain time on a certain day, they must be able to sail at a certain time because they're planning months and months ahead. Sometimes this, when we speak to masters after incidents, this has taken too much thought away from what if, what's going to happen in heavy weather. And I think one thing that we should try and use uh, seminars like this to do to try and promote the uh, promote the knowledge of what heavy weather can actually do to a ship, what it is doing to your ship, particularly in the large container ships nowadays. I think when we get later of a discussion about education of what other how we can teach of what needs to be more focused on, I particularly think heavy weather what it's doing to your ship and what it's doing to your containers is a huge aspect of that. So why is it so important for a container vessel? Well, it really is complicated. There's a lot of different factors and they're all interconnected. But we're going to start off with the basic, which is the cargo secure manual and your cargo lashing manual. Now, as uh, Daniel introduced earlier, and that was quite good because it does link into some of the stuff we'll be, I'll be talking about, is that the, the planning, the specifications, the requirements for these manuals are all based on the standards. And the standards are like SOLAS requirements. And the SOLAS requirements, which are introduced in the CSS code, they envisage maximum acceleration forces up to 30 degrees now for all ships because remember there is no separate code for container ships or for uh, cargo ships it's for all cargo so they envisage 30 degree rolls with an optimum gn now in the example i've got which is just taken from when one of the many instances uh, uh, 
that we have studied or been involved with. These accelerations only apply to a GM of 3.72 meters. It's very specific. If you go over that 3.72 meters, you have to start thinking and applying, uh, extrapolating data to get it. And you, you shouldn't be going there, which we will come back to later when we come back to the lashing manuals. The cargo secure manuals, when you, the, the class, et cetera, are flags there, considering the design considerations for each vessel, you talk about the rigid body motions and the accelerations. Wind loads, yeah, that's fair enough. Water sloshing, yes, water on deck. Initial forces from the cargo securing. Fine, that's all part of it. I'd like the, the rigid body motions, i.e. on a stable ship, which is staying in a uh, single plane, okay? However, there was an excellent uh, study done in uh, 2009, well, it was already a couple of years, but it was published in 2009, called the Lashing at Sea Project. Two very important factors which were found during that study were for container ships, the dynamic loads imposed by hull flexibility and the interaction between adjacent containers had not been or were not at the time being considered when lashing systems were being designed. It was these dynamic loads based on the actions in a seaway of a container vessel, which can make a huge difference. Now, Stuart had very good examples. He's seen it, he's physically seen it, of possibly a couple of meters flexing. When on a, a long uh, container vessel. Now, of interest with that is that they did a counter study or comparison between container vessels and uh, rurals and heavy lift vessels. And the design loads on those two types of vessels were generally found to follow the expectations, but the can, design loads in the container vessels exceeded them. Now, they did these by placing containers with measuring equipment and hull stress acceleration over a four, five, six month period on various vessels. So they got a good amount of data coming through. And again, as Stuart was saying with uh, the flex, what they found with the container vessels, the large container vessels, the wave impact can have a huge effect. Here you see on the top left where the bow starts to rise. And as the crest goes down the length of the ship, as the, the end sink, the, the flexing of the vessel can put on huge forces on the lashing equipment, huge forces on the container. But some of the, the flexing effects can take up to about 30 seconds. And as uh, we've also said, as Stuart also pointed out, that it, it's difficult to quantify. If your uh, dynamic loads are only based on uh, uh, fixed rotations, and you start putting in this additional uh, aspect of the, the motions, I suppose you could call it, then what does it do to your calculations? How good are they? And hopefully at the end of the day, or at the end of the seminar, Daniel uh, is up to date on this, he can possibly uh, give some input on that. Now, unfortunately, this, sorry, this is going to get a bit Messy. Oh no, here we go. I have a short video again by Marin. It was done part of this test. It's a long video, so I'm going to have to cut through it to try and get to the to keep within the, the 12 minutes or so. Here they are containers and they're doing the stacks. Now, if you look at the left and center stacks, you still have weights on them. The stacks on the right hand side, the containers on the right have no weight. This shows you the difference between uh, the difference motion between a stack loaded and a stack with light. The reason is they have different acceleration forces than the road. Everyone's continuing to know that things are slow. 
Period real speak. This, I think, really shows what can happen. Same setup where you have the left hand has some cargo, the center hand has more cargo, and the right hand has minimal cargo. So, there's not a lot happening. So, very soon. Now, purely because heavy stacks of heavy momentum, and they are fighting against that. Now, if you do that to play with a long period, obviously, there's going to be damage. As we previously stated, the cargo launching systems are designed for an optimum GM, okay? And the CSM or your, and or your cargo launching manual, they'll state the design GM. And most of them have a general statement such as this. Again, this is just lifted from one of our cases. The storage and securing is designed under the conditions of GM 1.2. Right? So if any reason the ship is operating with a larger GM, the expected accelerations will increase. Okay. If you cannot avoid your greater GM, then you have to either reduce your stack masses or your stack heights, or shift the masses to lower tiers in the stack. In other words, if you can't uh, fit your lashings or get to a GM at one point, in this instance, 1.21, you need to start playing about with the cargo to try and get it down, to try and minimize the loads on the cargo. Now, unfortunately, as many of us, the container uh, guys will know, the well, particularly large container vessels, they're sailing about with meters and meters of GM, particularly when they're at the end of a, a voyage. But for example, uh, Europe to Asia, when they're getting up to like Shanghai or Qingdao or someplace like that, and they are getting to the last port, and they've usually only got containers either in the hold, or there's a few on deck, or some light ones on deck, uh, not that much. They can have uh, four, five, six, uh, 10 meters of GM, which completely exceeds the allowables according to the uh, cargo washing manuals. The, 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 you can't do anything. You know, you've got no, the master has no option. There's nothing he can do. He can't, you know, because it's the planners decide the cargo goes here, he has to load it. He can see that his GM's too high. He has no control over the matter. He's trying to get the ship from A to B safely. And unfortunately, safely might include typhoon season. So he is facing a lot of difficulties. However, that does not distract from the fact that you do need to know what your CSM, your CLM says. You need to know the design limits. You need to know what you can do and what you cannot do with your lashings. And if you ignore them, you ignore them at your peril. Okay. Case. Let's ship. The optimum GM was uh, 1.28 meters. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Vessel sail with 5.48 meters. In addition to the high GM, they had high cubes, which were supposed to go into the container hold. Someone, some planner, uh, missed the fact they were high cubes, and they found they couldn't actually fit in the container. So the chief officer was faced with a decision to get them on board. So he decided, just start with the finger decision, okay, put them on top of those ones there. So they did, but he did not check using the loading computer. He did not check using the lashing computer. He didn't check that the stack loads were correct. He didn't check that the lashings were correct. 
And as you can see, all of the, the, these readings are not directly from the output, but this is what we've uh, extrapolated. The readings there show he's up to 169%, 120%, 140% over his limits. He admitted that he never checked, the master admitted that they never checked. Uh, just overload or overconfidence. I uh, spoke with the master and with the chief officer and I did not get the impression that uh, it was a lack of professionalism. It was just they thought it would be okay, but they never checked. And the vessel encountered heavy weather. What are you going to do? That's exactly what's going to happen. So the containers falling over port side, containers falling over starboard side. That was a combination of weather, uh, poor storage, uh, not falling through the procedures, not knowing your manual, not checking, and possibly not understanding what it is you need to check. Follow your CSM and your CLM. Can you spot the deliberate mistakes? On the left-hand side, you have the lashing plan for a vessel, recommended and approved by class. On the right-hand side, you have the actual lashing fitted. Okay, now I'll give you a few seconds. You've probably spotted it now. If you haven't, it's there. As you see, the chief officer, well, sorry, the chief officer issued the correct lashing. Steve Ross did an alternative lashing and no one noticed. There were just too many other things to go on. I only sailed it, they did sail at night time and it was quite soon to the next port. These things happen. You know, as Stuart said, the, the crew, they can't, the number of containers that have been moved at a time. If it's night time, to visibility, uh, everyone's trying to get sleep. You have security watches as well now, where you have to stand by gangway. Everything is going against the crew, trying to keep up with what's happening on deck. So, if something as simple as that, putting the lashings in the wrong place, the wrong type of lashings in the wrong place, and you get shift and failure. And it was as simple as that. We did counter checks, we looked at others, and if they had the correct fit, uh, lashings had been fitted, according to the computer, everything should have been okay. It's one simple mistake. And you know, if you need to point blame, then yeah, you're going to have to always point blame at the crew for not for not noticing. But I hindsight to me is a great thing. You have to understand and appreciate the situation at the time. But this is what happens or can happen. So when you do or some of that, what's, what do you do? What do we have to do? Well, first of all, if you start collecting the equipment or the lashing equipment, for, collect it, try and itemize it, find out what failed, find out how it failed. Because one of the first questions is, was it the containers that failed? Was it the containers that moved? Or was it the lashing equipment that moved? That's always your starting point. Where do you go with these things? Sometimes it's a mixture. Sometimes there's a domino effect, but you have to try and identify what the problem, what the cause of the problem is. Here we have, for example, on shoe boxes on the left hand side, as uh, Daniel was saying, it's unusual. Usually the, the shoe boxes should, they are the strongest part, and your container should go first. But in this instance, the shoe boxes fail. So then we'd have to consider. Okay, uh, was there something wrong with the construction of the shoe boxes? This is where you'd start to have to get metallurgists, etc., involved. On the right hand side, again, we have it was not the container that failed, it was not the lashing equipment that can fail, it was the lashing securing point that failed. So, again, we look at uh, corrosion, we look at uh, metallurgists to uh, find out what went wrong. Again, we have another shoe box failure, but fortunately we found the top, which was still attached to the twist lock on the right hand side. That should not happen. Your twist lock should fail. 
not your shoebox. So we have to question why did the uh, why was the twist lock stronger than the shoebox? Okay. In this instance, we have a twist lock that did fail, uh, and we have the the locking mechanism inside. Fortunately enough, we found most of them. Then we have to think: okay, was it because uh, the the loads, the stresses were excessive, or was it actual physical uh, damage to the, the twist lock? Was the twist lock itself weak? So then we try and take away these uh, the parts of the remainder of the lashing equipment, if required. Obviously, I mean, if the clients would pay for it, and do metallurgical uh, studies to try and find out if it was the metal itself. One thing that always comes up in these investigations is maintenance. When was the last time that the crew maintained the equipment? Do the crew have records of maintaining the equipment? How often did they maintain the equipment? And most uh, lashing with uh, the secure manuals will give you uh, guidance on how to uh, maintain the equipment. I would emphasize to all masters and crew and chief officers out there, make sure you do inspections and make sure you do make records of them. However, I would also say, you have to realize that it's almost impossible to do inspections and to do maintenance of twist locks, which in a well-run uh, ship, a well-employed ship, you might never see for months. They're on containers. They load, they've connected the containers when the containers go ashore. They've landed in boxes ashore. They then stuck onto another container when that container comes back on board. All you can ever see of a single uh, twist lock, you might see it at a distance for three, four months. You never actually physically get up close to these things. Plus, if you've got 11,000 containers on deck, how many twist locks do you have? How many lashing bars do you have? How much crew and how much time do you have to inspect and maintain all of this equipment. These are not extenuating, uh, uh, not, sorry, not excuses, but they have to be considered. And again, I, I am loath to blame the crew. Uh, you can blame the crew for obvious lack of maintenance where I've had heavy corrosion, etc. cited, but you, they cannot be blamed for everything. So the elements that cannot be controlled on board. The cargo secure inside the container. Now, obviously there are guidelines, uh, ILO's, uh, the container CSU guidelines on how containers should be stored. Now the guidelines are required because in many instances they've just been ignored or they've been poorly practiced or the uh, lack of knowledge by shippers or packers or Costs, they'll use a one ton lashing web instead of a five ton lashing web. Uh, very many various reasons of which we don't often find out. All we see is the results of them. You can see in the, the left hand side where we have a cargo of, uh, in this case, steel pipes, uh, just a couple of uh, web lashings on them. They went walkabout. For, in this instance, the ones on deck, fortunately, they didn't go very far. The weather was, it was okay, it was heavy, but it was not too bad. The master did take some avoiding action. So there was no actual container store collapse in this one. And I've just shown you the right hand side to show what could have happened, because it's the same cargo, except this is one of the containers which is in the cargo hold. If that other container had not been alongside the one on deck, what could have happened? You could have had that steel pipe flying out the side of that container, doing damage, possibly hurting the crew. Anything could have happened. So that is one thing we're going to have to worry about. Now, obviously, a big steel pipe like that, you say, yeah, okay, that's heavy. You can imagine that's going to uh, do damage. Paper, sorry, uh, plywood, thin plywood, not lashed. You see what it's done to a container. It's actually damaged all the side of it. Uh, this did lead to, there was uh, several lead containers and they did actually cause a container strike there as they fell over. 
One other thing we cannot control is the physical condition of containers. Okay, this one's an extreme example, uh, but they can lead to devastation. The container stack on the left-hand side were finally uh, pinpointed, in our opinion, that it was this container, and this container with a weak corner post. This is a crack where it went, and this was the condition of the remainder of the corner post. It took a lot of investigation, there's a lot of uh, uh, containers involved, and there are alternative views of, from the opposition, but this is what we consider to be. And the last and final is your declared cargo, which again is something you cannot control. You just have to take what you're told on the oath, and that's what you put into your, your, get, your Barclay plan from your, your cargo planners, and they're only taking what they're given, so they're taking it on faith, you're taking what they are given on faith, and you're given the information. You see here, this is a vessel called Eversmart. This is from the UK MIB accident report. The cargo on the left hand side, these are the ones that were the one the grey shaded areas but what they lost them. The uh, light brown were damaged and the blue ones were okay. If you look on the right hand side when they did a comparison of the weights, you see that along on the left hand side, the yellow ones which they were all over uh, up to 10%, some of them were up to 20%, one of them was up to 50% of the declared weight in the area of where the cargo was damaged. We can make connections quite easily here. Uh, the MIAB made their own connections. Because something like that, declared cargo weights, because your lashing plan, remember your lashing force is everything that declared of what you put in. And if what you put in is correct, what you get out is correct. If what you put in is nonsense, what you get out is nonsense. Because that kind of stuff will then end up with this. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, uh, Daniel. Indeed, this is a lot to take in and I think um, really an eye opener. I'm sure the audience would have a few questions for you. They have been uh, flowing, but uh, being taken care of as they've been coming. Um, it is dragged on for a bit, but I think it's been very, very meaningful. Never a dull moment so far. So uh, without much uh, more time, we'll go on to our favorite part, the Q&A session. I would request all our panelists to come on screen, uh, your mics and your cameras. And I would like to pass the center stage to our branch secretary, Captain Ken Elam, who will run with the Q&A session. Bring it on, folks. Give them a tough time. They've got all you need. So go for it. Over to you, Ken. <coughs> thanks uh, very much, Harry, and uh, thanks to all the panelists for um, a really, really interesting presentations on, on the subject. Um, I see the questions have, a lot of them have come in and a lot of them been answered. Um, but I think I'd just like to, I know we also over on time a bit. So, um, Daniel, in terms of um, progress going forward, um, Graham's obviously highlighted that there are still uh, a number of container losses occurring annually. Um, what is the way forward in, in terms of uh, legislation, regulation, to try and enforce better systems? Um, you know, you mentioned a, a really good 3D system that uh, DNV is working on. Is that something that we're going to see in the future on container ships? Yes. <clears throat> so there's the new container lashing force calculations that we have uh, developed now. Uh, are getting into service now. So this is uh, finalized. We will just uh, yeah, develop it further within next years to account for more uh, phenomena now that we cannot uh, do now. But we know that the system is able to do that with some further development. And uh, what we would like to um, work on because of recent incidents also, we noticed that uh, this, what has also been mentioned here several times, is that the gut feeling, as Stuart uh, uh, pointed out, uh, is, is difficult to have for crews now. So we are now um, 
evaluating possibilities uh, on how to increase uh, the awareness of crews for the actual loading conditions, what would be the actual limits of that condition in order to maybe get back some of the gut feeling. But uh, yeah, we are just starting that uh, process together with uh, some uh, operators on what would be helpful there and what could be done. Okay, super. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, Graham, in, in terms of the investigation side, obviously you do a lot of um, investigation work with, with regards to con container collapses and, and, um, and incidents at sea where containers are lost overboard. Um, in these investigations, do you, do you find that um, a large proportion, proportion of those incidents is a result of the actual equipment failure? Um, such as uh, lashings giving way, or is it more a human element that um, is, is at play in terms of understanding what lashings are required or not checking sufficient lashings? Uh, uh, there's quite a mixture of them. I think uh, quite often we find that there has been a lack of awareness of the cargo securing and lashing equipment limitations, i.e. what you can do with the lashings, and particularly in weather, most uh, incidents are weather related. Our uh, own experience backs up the uh, steamship, sorry, the Swedish club uh, data that is, a lot of it is connected with heavy weather, where the, it's basically just the forces in heavy weather which have been far exceeded and the forces in heavy weather which uh, are not possibly fully understood and the, the lack of uh, forward thinking into how to avoid weather and what the weather can do. Th this I think is something I tried to get to earlier where if you stay out of heavy weather, most of these accidents will go away. That, you know, it, it will, because our, our accidents are due to heavy weather. So that's my take on it so far. Okay, and, and I can see Stuart nodding his head. Um, but that actually came out of the, um, the container of the recent report that uh, Swedish Club did issue. And, and they said that, I think it was the I remember the numbers correctly, 4% um, of, of the claims were actually for containers lost overboard, but um, it actually attributed to 80% um, of, of the costs. So um, obviously heavy weather is, is, is an important um, aspect. Stuart, we'll come to that in a minute, but first I wanted to ask you with regards to, and there's been a couple of questions with regards to pre-stow as well. So in terms of the, the crew on board, um, on these uh, mega container ships that you've been sailing on, I understand that there is a limited number of crew on board. Can you tell us how many people actually work on these ships? Yeah, our total crew, well, the minimum safe manning certificate was actually only 13 uh, reasonably warm bodies, but uh, the practice was to have a, a minimum crew of 19. Uh, so that included your uh, chief mate, second mate, third mate, and six men on deck. So, you know, we're talking specifically about the cargo operation. Um, mm. And so you've only got, yeah, and then your, your watch routine for, for gangway watch and for keeping security. Uh, so mm. very limited man hours available. Um, I mean, a 400 meter long ship, 60 meters wide and 75 meters high uh, with, with over a, over a thousand uh, refrigerator containers plugged in, you've actually only got two men on a, on a six hour boat. Uh, so they, they absolutely can't look at everything. That's absolutely for sure. So is it, you know, where, where Graham has identified, um, you know, some issues on, on the investigations where um, the, the chief officer has potentially made a decision um, which hasn't been been checked. Um, is, is that something that's probably down to just a, a lack of time and resources for him to actually get around and, and to actually look at all of those things that need to be looked at, like the pre-stow 
checking the stability calculations, checking the lashings that are required, and actually physically checking that the stevedores have done what has been asked of them? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the number of things that, the, let's say, the officer on, on watch on the deck is looking at are multiple and various. It can be everything from, um, we spend quite a lot of effort uh, uh, these days, well, or we were spending a lot of effort very specifically on dangerous goods because that was seen as, as extremely high risk uh, with, for, for very good cause. Um, so the checking and cross-checking of the stowage and segregation and documentation of IMDG probably gets like a number one priority. The next priority is refrigerated cargo, so plugging in and unplugging out and the handing over of these quite often many, many, many integrated container, uh, refrigerated container loads, again, was a really high priority. Uh, the next one was, uh, I think, the Chief Officer's Ballywack in particular, stability, passed out to ballasting, and then not at the bottom of the heap at all, plenty of other things to check, but then came the lashing, and that was all pressed in right at the end. Um, there's often, you know, they work 200, 300 containers, then it moves away somewhere else, the gantry, and there's more under deck stuff. And then it's only at the end that you get six gantries all trying to finish off the deck load as it comes in. And of course, it's all at two o'clock in the morning. So the attention to detail does reduce. It's just a, a natural thing. You would almost think it's conspired to be like that, <laughs> but it's just the way it is. So dealing with all of that can, can be really hard. It's, and people are running around like, as we say in the classics, blue arsed flies, they really are. Um, it, it's, it's hard to pick up behind everybody else and accomplish everything. And in the dark, of course, you miss the more obvious things after the event, like lashing improperly applied. It's hard to see it on these very high deck boats. It's really hard to see it. And it's, it's only when, when the ship's at sea and you can see a whole stack sort of going out of kilter with the other stacks that you, you look really closely from the bridge, for example, and say, there's a problem. Go and look and you can see the whole corner casting is not actually seated on the twist lock, but it's <coughs> the end of the container swung through a, an arc like that and it's not secured on any twist lock at all. But you can't see that while the ship's working in port. You just can't spot it. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, so, so that, yeah, that paints to me a very good picture that the crews are, are, are still sort of as in our day on, on smaller vessels. Um, the, the requirements are still very much there and they really are um, expected, you know, there's a lot of expected of them to, to get around those vessels. And obviously, I think as was mentioned earlier, the pilot is booked for six o'clock. So everything has to be done before and, and that's sort of a deadline that is very difficult to, to change. Um, so that's that's a wonderful insight there. Um, I think the other, from recent research and, and publications, it, it, it clearly seems that heavy weather is, um, it, you know, plays a large part in the loss of containers at sea. Um, and, and I think, you know, for all of you, I've got a question there. Um, so Daniel, starting with you again on, on that, um, the programs that are going on board um, you know, that we're going to see in the future. Is there going to be more flexibility for um, integration with potential, um, not only weather forecast data, but actual real data that the vessels can actually put in to those to, to get a better understanding of whether the lashing systems are adequate or not? Mm, that is uh, some field we are looking into, but uh... This is, uh, as we are no software supplier itself uh, for the onboard use, we are just yeah, providing a framework, let's say, uh, for suppliers to develop their software uh, using that frameworks maybe. Um, so, yeah, I suppose a software supplier for company would be uh, uh, needed to ask for their research initiatives there. 
and uh, just for the heavy weather factor um, uh, and as to our uh, uh, experience from uh, damage incident uh, analysis uh, that's always uh, the heavy weather is not the only fact uh, uh, to be accounted for these incidents normally there's an accumulation of different factors that uh, led to uh, yeah, the storage going wrong. Um, so it's very difficult to narrow it down to one single uh, effect. Yeah, so I appreciate there are a number of factors that, that come into play. It's just the one, you know, the, the heavy weather has sort of been singled out in, in a number of publications now that, um, that points to a larger percentage of loss is attributable to um, heavy weather. Um, Graham, in, in your in investigations, is this something that um, you you find a lot where heavy weather is um, uh, a playing a playing a part in this, as opposed to equipment losses, etc., or equipment breakages? Uh, yeah, we, we did kind of cover that earlier. That sort of, uh, the, the, when you try and funnel or dig down and find out the, the causative effect. Uh, usually it is heavy weather. You can have poor condition lashings, you can have wrong lashings, uh, and if you're in good weather, you'll get away with it. Now, you may have uh, overweight stacks that you may not get away with, where the bomb containers could collapse in good weather and heavy weather. So that particular instance, your declared stack weights are not always weather dependent, though the weather does have an effect and accelerates, if you will, the, the damage for the, the higher stacks. The uh, poor, or poor lack of lashing or incorrect lashing or poor lashing equipment, uh, yeah, you, you'll, you, you can be lucky and get away with it in good weather. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and I, I think, Stuart, do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're on the subject of weather, and there's a couple of comments I would, I would like to make about, about how weather is actually observed. Um, one of the big things I was living with was to affect the maximum fuel savings that were possible. And, and one of the data sets that we got was um, a, an analysis of what we were reporting from the vessel in terms of the weather as we took our measurements and what the aftercast was was saying that the, the operations team would, would look at what our weather provider was saying about the weather at that geographic location at that time. And we were we were always overemphasizing in their opinion what we were seeing. It was a bit like the, the old Greek and his claim for logs over the side, you know, it was terrible weather. Well, we, we always had worse weather that we were reporting than the aftercast indicated from the weather provider. And there was a lot of friction between our fuel saving gurus and ship staff. And I can tell you that it was, uh, um, could be up to about four, two forces of both for differential between what we said we were seeing. But there was a problem. Um, I think all these forecasts actually come out and I'll, I'll be wrong if somebody comes in and tells me I'm wrong fine but I think they actually are at 10 meters above mean sea level your forecasting whereas we were actually experiencing up there something like uh, 50 meters above above the sea um, something else that wasn't forecast and by looking at the sea state on the old Beaufort scale it's not possible to see from an enclosed bridge 50 meters above whether what you're seeing is three meters or five meters or six meters. It's impossible. And even when you go stand on the deck and you're still, you know, 18 meters above the sea, it's really hard to measure. That's why I said earlier, I think we need a lot more hull censoring uh, to be developed so that we can actually really tell what the sea state is. And as we get closer to predetermined limits, to take action sooner. I, I think the seamen, depending on the gut feel and the ordinary practice and so on, what they need is a little bit more accurate 
um, scientific measurement. Um, and the last comment I've got uh, about that is um, I have seen some very strange results come out of anemometers on the top of these large mega structures. Um, very, very strange answers indeed. And came to the point where I, I actually didn't believe the anemometer at all. And they would fluctuate very wildly because of the gas. Now, when part of your container load on deck is predicated by pure wind force against the stack, especially when you're on coastal runs, that what you're experiencing with weather and what's forecast and what you've got are, are really different things. So uh, there's certainly room in that area for some, some work to be undertaken to give us better tools on board to take earlier action to avoid bad weather. Okay, super. Um, thanks very much. That's that's um, really, really um, insightful. So, gentlemen, I think um, we are a little bit over time. Um, I would like to thank, um, you know, Daniel, Graham and, and Stuart for participation and also answering these these questions and giving us some more insight. I'm going to hand back now to uh, to Harry, who will uh, close out the session. Over to thank you, Harry. You. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Ken. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, chaps, uh, Stuart, Daniel, Graham and all our participants. I think the questions have been really, really meaningful. And I think uh, it's been a really fruitful discussion on all fronts. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for the expertise and experience you'll have brought to this table. It's been absolutely brilliant. A quick word to all our participants. Don't forget to um, subscribe to our LinkedIn and uh, Instagram as well. Uh, and you could get updates. The recording of this would also be available. We shall discuss separately with the uh, panelists if they don't mind us sharing their presentations in soft copy and all that will be uploaded. Thanks once again and all eyes on our next webinar for the 28th of October at 1600 hours Singapore time on cybersecurity. Um, we shall reach out to you with the advert quite soon. But thank you once again and uh, have a great evening. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. For thank the you. Everyone. Thanks. Bye -bye.